please the court. My name is Megan Luca, and I'm here today on behalf of the appellant, Virginia Plaw, who's the personal representative for her deceased husband's estate. And your honors, to quote from the fourth DCA, I think this case needs to be reversed and remanded because there was a compelling need for a continuance and no good reason to deny it. And I'd like to start with- What about the 12 years that the case was pending? Is that constitute something that the court was entitled to take into consideration in granting and not granting another continuance? And it was, I believe, the fifth request for a continuance? No, your honor, it was not the fifth request. The trial court said it was the fifth, but it was not. And- What was it, the fourth? It was the, I believe it was the fourth. And in the reply brief, we actually went through in great detail to lay out the fact that these requests for continuance, the first one and two were both necessitated because of the actions of the defense. The first time it was because they wouldn't produce documents. And the second time it was because they wouldn't produce their own client for a deposition. And then at that point, it was Mrs. Plaw who was pushing the case for trial. She was the one who was noticing it for trial. And then they got it noticed for a trial and the court set it for a one week docket. And she called up opposing counsel and said, look, I think I need two weeks. Will you all agree to two weeks? And they said, no, you need to file a motion. So she filed yet another motion and the court agreed and said, all right, you know, you guys need to agree on a date. And then the case goes for years with nothing. And then her counsel gets ready. He asks for a date certain because he wants to protect the date for his experts. And then for reasons that aren't unclear for the record, all that we know is from Judge Foster who said, I guess he presided over the motion to withdraw and Judge Foster said on the record that it was his understanding that her trial lawyer didn't want to go to trial and she did. So the trial lawyer moved to withdraw on the eve of trial. That's not her fault. That is not something for which she needs to be punished. Well, it was, I guess the eve of trial for a trial that was then set, although I don't recall that exactly, but it was January, 2013 that substitute counsel appeared. Yes, Your Honor. And when did the case go to trial? September 23rd. So nine months later. Nine months later. And Your Honors, you asked about the age of the case, Judge Black. We actually cited for you in the briefs that the age of the case is not a reason to deny a continuance where you have a compelling reason to grant it. In Vollmer v. Key Developments, this court, the second DCA, reversed the denial of a continuance where the case had been pending for 10 years because in that case, the movement wanted a brief continuance and there was a compelling need for it. And there are cases for six years delay, seven years delay. And the first district has said that considering the need for balance, we respectfully do not see that the trial court could cite any sufficiently just reason to deny the motion, even given the age of the case. I didn't mean to imply that the age alone would justify the court's ruling, but I think that that in combination with the fact that I believe three other experts had been on board for a number of years and then when the new attorney came in, there was a desire to change the theory of liability. Just a number of factors converged to where, as you are well aware, we have to decide whether the judge abused her discretion in not granting another continuance. And I think that you have to look at all these factors, the time, the number of experts, the fact that there was a desire to change the theory of liability. And even though the new attorney did come on board, I guess in terms of this case, late in the game, still that attorney had nine months. It wasn't like the case was set 30 days later or 60 days later. The attorney comes in in January, the case is set in September. Your Honor, I think it's really important to remember that January 4th, he files a notice of appearance. Two weeks later, the defense wants the trial set for May. But it wasn't. But it wasn't. It was set for September. So that's in April, the case gets set for September. So in April, Jack Gordon learns he's got five months. All right, so he identifies Dr. Todd. He goes through 11 years of discovery. I think there were close to 30 depositions in this case. And he says, wait a minute, prior counsel's theory, it stinks. I got a new theory, it's better. I'm hiring Dr. Todd as my expert. And he discloses Dr. Todd. And in July, July 2nd, he says, Your Honor, I'm here on a motion. I want you to extend the discovery deadline because the defense won't give me what I need. They're breathing down my neck because they want my expert or interrogatories and they want a deposition, but they won't give me what I need. And so I can order in order for me to answer those interrogatories. And the court says, all right, I'm going to extend the discovery deadline. And at that hearing, it's really important. 
that the defense was screaming, wait a minute, we're not going to have enough time. We're not going to have enough time for our experts to look at this new theory. And the, the judge says, look, if you want a trial on September 23rd, this is the way we're doing it. All right, so that's July 2nd. August 1st, there's another hearing. And this time it's on a motion to compel because Jack Gordon is saying, Your Honor, they still won't give me what I need. I asked them for everything that their experts relied upon, and their response was, go look at the expert depositions. And Judge Foster said, that's not the way you answer that. You need to get together. You need to work this out. And at that hearing, the defense grilled Mr. Gordon. So you're going to have one expert witness, yes. And the dialogue was, all right, you're not going to use any other experts. He says, I'm not calling anybody else. Co-defense counsel, nobody that was in your answer to interrogatories. He says, I'm not, Gordon says, I'm not calling any other witnesses. Isn't that pretty common for the defense attorney to, to want to know who the experts are going to be? That is common, but Your Honor, give me one more second if you could indulge me. It got to the point in that hearing We've where been going 13 years, another second's not going to... Exactly! <laughs> We've been going 11 years, another 90 days is a drop in the bucket. But here's where I'm going with this dialogue. The, it got to the point where Judge Foster was annoyed with defense counsel. He said, look, he just told you, I have one expert. It's Dr. Taub. And defense counsel was still relentless. They wanted to know if there were different experts for liability and causation. And Jack Gordon nods his answer. He says, no, it's just Taub. And at that point, defense counsel says, you need to speak up and say it audibly for the record. They set him up. That was August 1st. On August 23rd, it was Dr. Taub's deposition, and at that deposition, they asked the question, well, Dr. Taub, is there anything wrong with your CV? And he says, oh my God, there's a typo on this. Is that a setup, or is that good lawyering? That is not good lawyering. If you, I've read a couple bar articles that say that when you look at the integrity of the judicial system, the best way to do that- What is it the defense's obligation to point out that the plaintiff has a problem with his credentials? It's not their obligation. Yeah, aren't they supposed to be zealously defending their client? Your Honor, I would liken this to a bad faith setup. It is absolutely an attorney's obligation to try to get their client the coverage that they deserve, but they don't have the right to go about doing that. What should they have done? Should, should, is it the defense's duty to write a letter and say, listen, I just wanted to alert you to the fact that there's something on your expert's CV that is inaccurate. Your, your expert is not licensed as he says he is. So have a good day. Just wanted to let you know. No, Your Honor. You file your motion to strike when you find out. They have never denied that they sandbagged this case. As politely as one can make that accusation, Mr. Gordon made it at trial. I made it in the, answer, in the initial what brief. What if they, they didn't have... bring it out before trial? What if they waited and just objected at the time of trial? They voir dire the witness. He's not licensed, and now they say, Judge, we move to exclude the witness. They I think that, that would have that been... That sounds like closer to sandbagging anyway, although some might argue that's good lawyering. They didn't tip their hands. You're supposed to know, not you, but your client's supposed to know the qualifications of their expert. Unfortunately, it sounds like to a degree the expert misled plaintiff's counsel. And Your Honor, if I could touch on that for just one second, they're going to argue, they're going to, Mrs. Leineke is going to come up here and tell you that Jack Gordon should have done a better job vetting his expert. We are all lawyers. We all know what it's like to work under limited, under limited time and with limited resources. He had five months to go through 11 years worth of contentious discovery and get this case ready for trial. And he was telling the trial judge, Judge Foster said to him at that August 1st hearing where he's saying, it's only going to be Tob. I'm only using Tob. Judge Foster said, Jack, you look like hell. Are you sure you can get this done by September 23rd? And he said, I'm using one expert. It's going to be Tob. I have streamlined the issues. We don't need a continuance. I'm going to make this happen. And that is what the defense had been banging on the table demanding. They wanted and, a trial and, in May. And had, had Dr. Tob been licensed and thereby enabled to give a standard of care opinion, everything might have turned out just fine. No, Judge Black, I disagree. I think that if Judge Tob, if um, Dr. Tob had been licensed and had been able, it would have been the defense screaming, just like they did in July. We need more time. Our experts cannot possibly prepare to combat this theory. And that's what this was all about, is they didn't want to take on Dr. Taub's theory. So they went Tanya Harding style. They didn't want to compete, so they just kneecapped the expert. And I mean, if you're looking at this, look well, at this interestingly, case. Interestingly, though, arguably they would have been in a better position to ask for a continuance because after X number of years, the lawyer for the plaintiff has changed the theory. 
And that is, that is a, a, it's hard to say, well, they would have asked for it, they would have been wrong to ask for it, they would have been whining and moaning. They might have, but they're not the ones who changed the theory. But, Your Honor, there's nothing that says that Mrs. Plow wasn't entitled to change her theory of the case. Of course she is. And she had nine months to do it, and she got an expert who apparently was not competent to testify. No, Judge Silverman, I, I want to be real clear, because they argued that in their answer brief, and I want to make sure that this court does not get distracted by that. What they were arguing under the wrong Florida statute is that Dr. Taub was required to have an active license. Under the appropriate version of the Florida statute, he was not required to have a license. All he needed to do was satisfy the court that he was an expert, and he did that because the trial court let him testify about causation. This was a doctor, he'd been a doctor for 50 years, 25 as a full professor of anesthesiology at Yale. He'd opened the Yale Pain Clinic. He'd testified in dozens of trials. His testimony had never been rejected. His CV is part of the record. Mr. Gordon put it in there because he wanted to establish that it is a tome. Jack Gordon had five months from April to September to get this case ready for trial. The defense was breathing down his neck to make it happen. He had nine months because he got in the case in January. He got in the case in January, but it was not set for trial until April. So in April, he knows a date certain, September 23rd, he's going to trial. So even, let's say he had nine months. Predecessor counsel, the defense. But look, Mr. Gordon has been at this a long time. When I was a young lawyer, he was out there in the game just like I was. And he's a good lawyer and he's been around. And I'm sure he had to know when he took the case that was 11 or 12 years old when he took it that, you know, we're going to have to go to trial here pretty soon. He did. And, Your Honor, we've cited it in the brief for you. He represented to the court over and over again. He said, look, I'm asking you to extend the deadline because I don't want a continuance. I think we understand the case, the facts of this case. So why don't you hit some law for us as to why this is an abuse of discretion? Because an abuse of discretion standard, you've been doing appellate law for a long time now. You know that's a tough burden to overcome. And I have some concerns as to whether this was an abuse of discretion. Do I think maybe it ended up being an unfair trial? I might have some concerns about that. But the test is, was it an abuse of discretion? Would no other judge in this state have done what this judge did? Your Honor, I think three cases. I want to draw your attention to three. Silverman v. Miller, 514 Southern 2nd 77. In that case, the doctor was named Dr. I'm sorry, I've got my. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to start with Fisher v. Perez. 947 Southern 2nd 648. Dr. Piper was the expert there. And in that case, Dr. Piper couldn't appear. It was a medical condition. Was that 51477? I'm sorry. Fisher v. Perez is 947 Southern 2nd 648. And the court said live testimony was especially important in this case because Dr. Piper had changed his opinion between the time of his deposition and the addendum report. And in that case, they asked for a continuance. The trial court said, no, use your expert's deposition. The court said without Dr. Piper's live testimony, the jury might not have understood what Dr. Piper's opinion was or why he had changed his mind. And that's a problem we had here. Because in this case, Mrs. Plow was forced to use not only deposition transcripts, but discovery depositions taken by the defense on the predecessor theories of the case where her own lawyer, her predecessor lawyer, didn't even ask questions. So they weren't meant to be used at trial. And not only that, they were predecessors' theories. So the standard of care testimony didn't match Dr. Taub's causation testimony. And the defense highlighted that during his closing argument. He got to take advantage of the fact that there was no match. And Jack asked the trial lawyer, he said, please, if you're not going to let me get a new expert, at least let me finish Dr. Taub's deposition so I can try to make these match. And she said no. And the Fisher court said, further, the deposition was not taken for trial purposes, nor was it videotaped. Same circumstance here. Thus, the jury could make no assessment of Dr. Piper's credibility. This was a med-mal case. I think for you all, it's black letter. In a med-mal case, it is necessarily a battle of the experts. And if you exclude even cumulative testimony in a med-mal case for an expert, that's harmful error. And in this case, Mrs. Plow couldn't make her theories match, and she had to use discovery depositions to try to put on her case when the defense got to put on three live experts. And Jack Gordon gave the court 
an affidavit. He said, look, I called all three of these experts the minute you denied my motion. And on two weeks' notice, they can't get here. They can't even give me a deposition. And the Fisher court said that Dr. Piper's testimony was what his, that the entire case rested on Dr. Piper's testimony. And that therefore his deposition was inadequate to convey his opinion to the jury. Reversed and remanded. Silverman Ms. v. Milner. You didn't indicate at the beginning if you want to reserve any time for rebuttal when you're I'm at so 15 sorry. and a half minutes. Okay. So what um, would you like to do? I would like to reserve some time, but I would like to hit you with my other two cases. Silverman v. Milner, 514 Southern 2nd 77. Again, that was a case where there was a, a witness and the court said, you, your witness isn't available, use a deposition instead. And the court reversed and remanded. They said that, it, it, that there are some cases where there is such an injustice that the court has an obligation to fix it, especially where the defense isn't going to suffer any prejudice. And finally, Labue v. Traveler's Insurance, 388 Southern 2nd, 1349. Again, it was an expert witness. He wasn't available. And the fourth DCA said that the bare bone discovery deposition of the physician taken by the appellees and presented in part to the jury did not include all of the essential testimony sought to be presented by the live testimony of the witness nor did it serve as an adequate substitute for the live appearance of the physician upon which the jury could make a valid determination of credibility in a trial which was largely a contest of the experts. Reversed and remanded, denial of the continuance was an abuse of discretion. Those are this case. And I will save my remaining time for rebuttal. Very good, you've got about three and a half minutes. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm Shelley Leineke on behalf of Dr. Barza and his professional association. The trial court in this case did not abuse its discretion in denying this continuance. Uh, the verdict that said that Claw's heart attack was unrelated to Dr. Barza's care should be affirmed. Trial counsel was given fair warning of the trial date. Uh, and just decided he wanted to retool his case to come up with a new theory some more than a decade after discovery had been going on. Uh, the prior theory was that the, the, the pain that this man was experiencing was, was not, uh, it was a poor theory that he was trying to come up with. He was trying to come up with a theory that the pain wasn't due to nerve damage and that he never should have had this, this surgery in the first place. And, and the cobbling together that was referenced in the plaintiff's brief is really not the, the trial uh, that, that took place and the theory that was presented at trial, the cobbling together was trying to come up with some new theory. And I suggest that the theory that Dr. Todd was trying to come up with was, was not a good theory. He was trying to say, wait a minute, this pain, plaintiff's back pain was due to arteriosclerosis, uh, not to the nerve damage, when for nine years and I think eight prior injections, uh, Mr. Pla had been getting relief from the care that uh, he was being provided by, by the, uh, Dr. Barsa. Dr. Taub did give his opinion. He, he testified at great length, uh, consistent with the other experts, on uh, whether or not the, the appropriate medication was, was used as the induction agent. But he also said, and he testified at page 719, that uh, Mr. Pla should not have been there at all, um, he, he, which was his opinion, that, that this witness or pardon me, this uh, procedure should not have been done, uh, that it was inappropriate. I don't think it's appropriate for, for counsel to say, well, let's only look at this last couple of months here, uh, that he only wanted a 90-day con continuance here. Uh, this case had been going on for some 11 years and were some 13 years from the time of this incident. Counsel was told and knew there had been a hearing before Mr. Gordon came in saying, when this case is, is put on a docket, it's, it's a priority case, and he had plenty of time to do this. He decided five months after he's hired uh, and, and comes in as counsel that he's going to list this expert, and from the facts, it looks like he listed this expert before he ever contacted him, because some two months later, he, uh, Dr. Taub is listed in, uh, I believe it was May 30th. In July, there's a hearing uh, on, on this issue, and Mr. Gordon says, well, I don't know what he's going to say. Uh, I, I can't do my expert disclosures with him because I don't know what he's going to say. He hired this man almost two months earlier, certainly a month and a half earlier, and not only does he not know uh, that the, this expert's 
credentials are in, not in anesthesiology and pain management, which was abundantly clear from, from the CV, but he also didn't even know what the opinions were. Again, making it look like he just hired this expert, said, let me see if I can find someone that will support some new new argument that I'm floating here, and, uh, and let me retool this case. One of the issues that comes up on the denial of a continuance is how a party either party would be prejudiced by either the grant or denial. Was there any argument to the trial court as to how your client would have been prejudiced by a continuance? The, the trial court's uh, order that was dated September uh, 11th of 2013 noted that the defense had also had this issue of uh, was going to end up with prejudice because Dr. Barsa was entitled to his day in court as well, and he was, Dr. Barsa's counsel made comments that he was concerned that he was losing his experts. Uh, we're now 10 years into this case. His experts are getting older. His experts have, have had to, to get ramped up for trial on more than one occasion, and he wanted to get this case tried. He'd been objecting to continuances since 2008, some uh, four years before this case is actually tried. He's saying, no, we want to go forward. We want our day in court. We want this over. So there was no injustice to, to, to PLA. We've got the three elements here that have been said repeatedly. Uh, does the denial create an injustice for the movement? Is the reason for the continuance unforeseeable and not due to dilatory tactics? And is there prejudice or inconvenience to the opposing party? And in each situation here, in each of these elements, the answer supports exactly what the trial court did here. Uh, there was no injustice to PLA. This case was fully ready. It had been set and, and experts had been deposed. The parties knew what their theories were for years. When, uh, when, when PLA came forward with this new theory, was, was, did that require any additional uh, experts on the part of the defense? It, yes, it would have. It absolutely would have required new experts to, to testify, or certainly there, the existing experts would have had to have uh, additional opinions. So we would have gone through another... Was, it, was anyone new retained, or was it the same group that had been on board over the years? As the case was, was tried, there were no new experts that were retained at that point. Again, the defense didn't learn what Dr. Taub's opinions were until uh, the 11th hour when he was finally deposed just before trial. So at that point, uh, there was a discovery cut off and the defense was not allowed to add experts. Um, we cited cases in our brief where the courts, uh, appellate court said, uh, for example, in Mayhouse, M-E-J-I-A-S, it's within the court's discretion to deny a continuance of a 10-year-old case. And the Taylor versus Mazda case, uh, the court in that case said that it was not going to allow any continuances unless it was mandatory by law. And then, <coughs> and then the uh, counsel asked for another continuance because uh, he was moving his office. And the appellate court said no. Uh, the, the judge has to have the ability to control his calendar and uh, act in a, in a way that the court feels is necessary for getting a case to trial. Uh, in terms of the issue of sandbagging, that was that is just simply an in, inappropriate allegation. Uh, when you read the, the uh, transcript, uh, Mr. Gordon was asked who you're going to use. The defense had it came up with the defense saying, we want to have a limitation of experts on the other side. There should only be one standard of care expert. The plaintiff shouldn't be allowed to have multiple experts. And Mr. Gordon said, well, I think I'm gonna to use Todd, but I'm gonna wait another two or three weeks until my discovery cutoff because I don't know what he's going to say yet. So he was not baited or led into anything. Uh, and and he, he had the CV and when he talked to Dr. Taub, he should have realized this man's background and training was not in anesthesia. Uh, the licensing issue, um, is not uh, really the, the issue here. Under 766-102 that was in force at that time, where a defendant such as Dr. Barsa is board certified, the opposition expert has to be a similar health care provider, which was defined as someone either with the same training and experience 
or is similarly board certified. Dr. Taub did not meet either of those requirements. But nevertheless, uh, I would say probably 90% of the objections to his deposition testimony were overruled, uh, and, and he was allowed to testify very broadly at trial. The plaintiffs had their full day in court. Uh, they were allowed to present their theory. Dr. Taub even did say that this plaintiff should not have been there at all. They had their standard of care experts, they had their causation experts, and the trial court acted within its discretion. We would ask for this court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Wood. Judge Silverman, you asked Ms. Lina Key, how did Dr. Barsha suffer prejudice? And really, she didn't answer your question. She said that Dr. Barsha said that he had lost experts in the past. And I'd like to tell this court that at page 5480 of the record, Dr. Barsha actually said that he was going to lose an expert in this case if it went to trial on September 23rd. So that excuse does not hold water. The fact of the matter is there was no prejudice in this case. They have never articulated one. The trial court asked point blank, how is your presentation going to suffer if I grant this continuance? They said, we don't know. The trial court made up an excuse and said that the cost and inconvenience of having to depose a new expert to combat these theories was a reason to justify denial. There's no record evidence to support that. The only thing that counsel said at the hearing was that, um, and this is at 5465, and not only to talk about the money aspect of getting experts ready each time, but they've been inconvenienced. That was it. And Judge Silverman, in the Riley case, you actually wrote, it is undoubtedly inconvenient and sometimes costly to appear for a trial that is continued, but those practical concerns must certainly yield in appropriate circumstances. This is that case. And Your Honor, this is an abuse of discretion standard, but it's actually a very hybrid version because it's clear that there's three factors you consider. It's abuse of discretion, but limited to the consideration of three factors. And the courts seem to focus on one and two, which is, did the movement suffer an injustice from the denial and would the non-movement have been prejudiced had the continuance been granted? And the courts say, this is the first DCA, 2011, Garner. There, this court has an obligation to rectify injustice visited upon a moving party by the denial of a motion for continuance, particularly where the opposing party would suffer no injury or great inconvenience as a result of the, of the continuance. Yaris, 4th DCA, an analysis of the relevant factors indicates that there was a compelling need for the continuance in this case, and as far as we can glean from the record, no compelling reason to deny it. Your Honors, they had an answer brief, and they've had this oral argument, and they have not articulated to you one good reason why they, shouldn't, why they would have suffered if this continuance had been granted. The 4th DCA has said, well, if it's the cost of having to take a new deposition, if it's the cost of having to hire a new expert, you, you cure that by assessing the costs associated with the delay on remand. This court has said in Neal v. Swaby that cost concerns cannot overcome valid reasons for a continuance. Judge Silberman, you have said, you have noted, and the Thompson General Motors Court, 2nd DCA also, that the inconvenience normally incident to trial delay is not a sufficient justification. In this case, the defense got to put on three live witnesses. Mrs. Plow was forced to use three discovery depositions taken by the defense on a prior theory of the case. If you're a juror and you've got three live witnesses and you've got three discovery depositions, in a med-mal case where expert witness testimony is absolutely critical, it is the focus point of the entire case, Ms. Plow absolutely suffered injustice. She was forced to use mismatch theories. She was forced to use discovery depositions. And this is all in a case where the defense was actually saying, we need more time. If we're going to combat Taub's theory, we need more time to sit down with our experts and work up a response. And you're about out of your time, Ms. Luca. Thank you. Thank you. The final case on the docket for this morning is Hagenson versus Port of Islands Hotel and Resort.